I have worked the graveyard shift as a cashier at a rather large Indian casino resort for years and have met my fair share of creepy tweakers and nasty old men. You get used to it after a while and learn to brush most of it off with the comfort of knowing that you're always there with a the camera on you and plenty of armed security guards milling around. In all the years that I have worked there, I have only ever been truly freaked out by a guest once. He was there often, a regular. I'm guessing he had some sort of mental disability, not really sure what it was, but there was clearly something off about him. He was probably in his early 30s, already balding and often averted his eyes when spoken to. He had grandparents that would sometimes come in with him, but usually just drop them off at the casino whenever they had things to do. He would try to make small talk with the cashier sometimes when he cashed out his tickets, but never more than a few words at a time, until he started with the compliments. They started out innocent enough, like, I like your hair, and they were always only ever directed at me or another cashier named Tracy. Now me and Tracy don't look alike, but we're both bigger girls and have similar features that this guy was apparently attracted to. Moving on, the compliments got progressively weirder. I like your fingernails, I like your eyelids. The compliments led to some laughs and a lot of sounds of the lambs, skin jokes from coworkers. We laughed too and then brushed it off like every other creepy moment we got. Then one day, the guy walks up to my window and says, Hi, Jerry. What size shoe do you wear? I was thrown off by the new nickname and immediately threw out a random number as all the skin jokes came flooding back. Although I was sufficiently creeped out, I still wasn't feeling threatened. I tried to appear busy when the guy would approach my window, but as I am stuck in a cage while I'm at work, I couldn't exactly run or hide. Unfortunately, the nickname stuck and creepy guy continued to call me Cherry and the weird compliments kept coming. I tried to talk to some of my supervisors about the situation, but they found it too funny to see me cringe at his approach and assured me that I was never in any real danger, and that the guy was just socially awkward and harmless, until the compliments finally went overboard. One night I was cashing out the creepy guy's tickets when he looked straight at me in the eyes and asked, Do you like to be tied up? Excuse me? I said, completely dumbfounded. I'm gonna tie you up. I just stared at him alone in my cage and unable to think of a response. He finally broke eye contact after what felt like forever, and then he started laughing loudly and walked away from my window. That was the last straw. The casino manager was informed and it came out that there was a girl in the beverage department that had also been being harassed. The worst part is that because his grandparents spend quite a bit of money at the casino on the regular, all he got was a stern talking to by the casino manager. Luckily for me, they came a lot less after the incident and eventually stopped coming in altogether. So, creepy casino guy? Glad you didn't come in anymore, and let's never meet again. This happened back in 2010. I was working in a hotel suburban area. It was a really nice place. When I first started there, I was both a PT front desk clerk and a PT night auditor. I had just been promoted to a day job and a week left at the front desk before I was switching to my Monday through Friday gig. It was just like any other night. That's when around about 3 a.m. I received a phone call. The guy sounded my age and attempted to strike up a conversation with me. I have to give my name when answering the phone, so he got my name, of course, and starts asking me personal questions, which were harmless, but nevertheless, I tell him I'm hanging up as I have a job to do. He wouldn't give me his name, but instead he said, why don't you call me John? I hung up and finished my shift. The next night at around 3.30 a.m., I received another phone call from John. He started off with asking me out for a drink again, to which I declined and hung up on the phone. He called back about five times that night, each time getting more lewd in his comments and just trying to keep me talking. He ended his last call with the phrase, I see you like singing karaoke. I love doing that. Let's go out together sometime. I had just gone on a few nights prior with my friends and posted about it. I asked him how he knew my full name and he wouldn't tell me. I hung up. I deleted my Twitter and Foursquare pages and when my boss came in at 7am, I told him what had been going on. We told my GM and my security guard put it in his report. I only worked two overnights a week, luckily, but when I came back in the next week, so did he. The phone call started around 3am and lasted for an hour or so. But this time was a little bit different. John? was angry that I deleted my accounts so he couldn't keep an eye on me and make sure I wasn't cheating on him. I told him to fuck off and that I'm not answering the phone anymore. 
and told him that my security guard would be taking all of his calls that day forward. He went silent for about 10 seconds and then screamed, You're going to be with me whether you like it or not. I'm coming for you. And he hung up the phone. I, of course, freaked the fuck out and called the police. Luckily, I had my security guard there, so I wasn't completely alone. But thank God it must have been a slow night because it took the cops mere minutes to get there. I called my night supervisor who left at 11 p.m. and he managed to calm me down. One cop was nice enough to stay there until my shift was done and with that I told my boss that even though I had a week left of overnights, I couldn't and wouldn't do it. Thankfully they understood and I moved to daytime hours as well as sent an email out to everyone telling them that anyone who called for me was sent directly to the GM. Thankfully, everything stopped after that, minus a few phone calls from the security guy for about a week. He told the guy that I had quit because of him, and the call stopped. This still creeps me out though. We think he may have been a former guest at the hotel, but I never found out who it was. I work in the night shift in a 24-hour restaurant in a mid-sized city in Australia. I've been living in the city for maybe six years, working at this restaurant for four. Especially since the asylums all got closed down. Same as in America, the crazies got pushed out onto the streets, and here it was back in the late 90s. They're all mostly harmless, they're just cigarettes, a conversation. I met one fellow I actually really liked. He said he was a failed artist. We had a few smokes on the bench while I was waiting for a bus, and he paraphrased his life story for me. He did abstracts, maybe a bit of money overseas blew it all in coke addiction, and lost his mind. Most of it was babbling, incoherent, but that was the story I got from it, and he gave me a painting afterwards, a watercolor of a skull. I think I still have it. That was years ago. Meeting that man, I don't really talk to all the homeless or the crazies anymore, like I used to. A few experiences soured me on it. This latest one is kind of the culmination of all of it. I think sometimes that it's impossible that anything ever really gets worse. It's cynical, isn't it? Like, things are bad when they're good? Even in Gary, Indiana, which I grew up near, I had a few good years before it all went to hell. But it's hard to ignore, and maybe it's just me, but I feel like every day I'm living in a constant dread. My house seems much darker at night than it used to. More sounds, creaking, bangs, too mysterious to brush off. Anyway, this happened last week. Like I said, I've been working in the middle of the city at this restaurant for four years. In addition to the street lunatics, I've met a lot of regulars, and they're about what you'd expect from the type of person that would populate a restaurant at four in the morning. Every morning without fail. Myself included, now that I think about it. Anyways, there was this egg man who always, always orders eight poached eggs with no brown on the edges, then dips them in melted butter and shoots it all down his throat. And then there's a fellow who always thinks he's some kind of hacker, always wears little round John Lennon sunglasses and a trench coat no matter what the weather is, and a woman with an eating disorder who used to eat more food than I did in an entire day. Although I'd never seen the fellow with the keyboard before this night, hopefully I never see him again. Anyways, it was near 2 in the morning and I was all by myself. Graveyard shifts are run on a skeleton crew and I was changing the bins. To change the bin, you have to unlock a door up a flight of stairs, go down the stairs to the room where the empty bins are kept, then roll the full bin down an alleyway and the empty bin back up to put it underneath the trash chute. It's a ridiculously overcomplicated situation, but the reason this particular restaurant makes money is because they don't waste overhead on little things like this. Well, I stopped for a cigarette at the bottom of the alley before I rolled the empty bin up, and as I opened the door to roll it inside at the top, I hear music. I heard the Star Spangled Banner song, loud, and the instrument sounded strange, like music in an old video game. I look up and down the street, crews of drunks are walking towards me, making me nervous as always. And at the other end, a man with a giant electronic keyboard under his arms. The man was old, maybe in his 70s, but he was robust, big arms, and he was wearing stained shorts and a short sleeve button up that had a few buttons. He had long white hair, slick back, and a bit of a beard. He was grinning and he had a handlebar mustache that ended halfway on, down his mouth, on one side and went to his neck on the other. Now, I've never been to New York, but I imagine you'd see people like this there every day. Not so creepy, right? But it was still strange to me because I'm from America. I grew up in the States, moved to Australia when I was 15 for a few reasons I won't go into, but... As I was saying, I was very unnerved, 
and boy was he grinning. Ear to ear, he had shell shock eyes. You could see them in the street light glare. He said, Hey mate, too loud. Screamed it, and I hustled the bin inside and slammed the door behind me. I thought to myself, You're acting very strange. I thought to myself, You're overreacting. It's just a weird old man. It's just a coincidence he's playing that song. So I change the bins over, and I'm rolling the full one out onto the street. And of course, he's right there. He said something to me, but I couldn't hear it over the boom of the music. What? I asked him. And he says the same thing again. And I just grin and smile and start walking the full bin down the alley. The music stops halfway down when I get the bin room door and open it up. I was about to roll the full can in backwards, and he was just standing there. He was swaying a little, but didn't look drunk. He smelled like cologne, still grinning. He wasn't blinking for a while. I couldn't think of anything to say. He obviously expected something. So I asked him, Can I help you? You're a Yank. What? H how could you tell? Accent, mate. Of course. Idiot. I took out my cigarettes, figuring if I gave him one, maybe he'd leave. But he pushes past me. Now the bin room is connected to basically a defunct bar in the basement of the restaurant complete with booths and he sits in one before I really know what's happening. Maybe I should have said something by then, gotten a little confrontational, but I was exhausted and my head hurt and by my nature I'm not really the type. I just walk in with the door still behind me, still holding the cigarettes and lighter and I say, what are you doing? You can't- He hits a button and the keyboard lights up. He puts it on the table and it started playing the fucking star bangled banner again and he's yelling over it. You cunts really fucked up Vietnam, eh? You cunts really fucked it up, eh? I said, I don't- He started hitting it with both hands. It didn't break, but the music broke up. He was wheezing, yelling obscenities. I ran. Went upstairs, I told the girl working the floor what was happening. And she followed me downstairs on the phone with the cops. You know already, of course, he was gone. All that were left were some plastic chips from the keyboard, but that was it. The cops came by, and they seemed pretty pissed that I had wasted their time, which was understandable to say the least. I saw him one more time though. It was about a night or two ago. Getting my car out of the garage across the street, level 6 which was pretty far up, I looked over the railing and he was there on the street, across the street, and he was looking up at me, or at the garage I guess. He had his keyboard with him, and he knew my face too, and that I was American. I really hope I don't ever see him again after this. This all happened when I was about 16, in high school and working my first part-time job at a fast food restaurant located right off the highway. It wasn't uncommon to get a lot of crazy customers. I arrived at work one day and was surprised to see that my schedule for the week had changed, giving me a graveyard shift on the Friday night. The thought of being at this place overnight gave me the creeps and I thought my manager was insane for making me, the youngest employee, take a night shift. But it wasn't a school night and I didn't want to seem like a baby, so I accepted the shift. When the night came, it was just me and another co-worker who was a larger man and was very friendly. So I felt more safe with him there. Before leaving, my manager gave me the rundown on how the night was supposed to go. At 11pm, I was supposed to lock the doors and we would only be taking drive through orders. But on this particular night, which was just my luck, one of the main doors had been broken and wouldn't lock properly. He said, if anyone comes in, just tell them they can't be in the lobby and to order through the drive through After these words of wisdom, my manager went home to the comfort of his bed and I started my long night. Being slightly paranoid and not used to the new shifts, the every noise I heard from the outside made me jump. A few times some customers came in through the unlocked door but quickly and politely left after being asked. When it reached about 1am, I was in the back of the store organizing boxes when I heard the slam of a heavy door. I ran to the front to tell whoever it was that they couldn't go through the door but I saw no one. I walked into the lobby and looked around for a bit but didn't see anyone there. Did you hear someone come in? I asked one of my coworkers as he also came to investigate. Maybe they left but I'll check the bathroom just to be safe, he said as he opened the men's bathroom, then quickly came back out. Nope, no one's here. You should check the girl's bathroom, he advised. I agreed and opened the door to the women's bathroom. At first I didn't see anything, so I called out, anyone in here? 
no response. To double check, I took a few steps into the bathroom, and at this time, I was able to see some feet behind a stall. The stall door was wide open, and as I got closer, I was able to see inside. My stomach instantly sank. I caught eyes with a woman with long, tangled brown hair crouched next to the toilet with a needle in her arm. She jumped up out in surprise and ripped the needle out of her arm. Blood squirted all over the floor. She raised the needle over her head and started running towards me. I screamed and ran as fast as I could out of the bathroom and past my coworker. I whipped around just in time to see her run out of the door. My heart was racing and I was scared half to death and ended up going home right after that. I quit the next day. So, lady shooting up in the bathroom at one in the morning? Let's never meet again.